we're going to hear a conversation between an agent and a client. First, you have some time to look at questions 1 to 6. Now listen to the tape and answer the questions. Hello. Hi. Good morning. Are you open yet? Yes, we are. Come in. Would you like to rent an apartment in the city? Well, kind of. I'd rather rent one near the harbor if possible. Oh, okay. Do you like the water? Yes, I do. But I actually repair sailboats for a living. So I'd like to be close to work. That's understandable. We all want to live close to work. Well, I think I have something near there. How many rooms would you like? Just one. I'm alone. But I would like to have an extra room for my dog. So you'd like two rooms and an apartment that accepts animals. Hmm. Here's one. It's one block up from the harbor and renting for $445. How's that? That's perfect. Just what I was hoping to pay. What floor is it on? Floor? Oh, it's on the twelfth floor. That's too high. I'd like to be on the first or second floor so that I don't have to use the elevator. My dog, he's scared of them. Oh, well then, that's a little more complicated. Let me make a few calls. Okay, I think I found a couple more for you. Here's one that might suit your needs. How much? $395 a month. That's cheap. But it's only a one-bedroom, a large one, but it's still just one room. Oh. Well, regardless of whether the room is small, I still need a separate room for my dog. What else do you have? Then I have a two-bedroom for $565 on the second floor that is a little further away from the harbor. How far? About a half mile, and they accept pets. That's a little more than I had planned on paying but I guess I could look at it. What's the address? 224 Williams Avenue, Harbor Square. 224 Williams Avenue. Got it. Now look at questions 7 to 10. As the talk continues, answer questions 7 to 10. What else is included? Let's see. It has a washer and dryer, refrigerator and stove, a bed, dressers and shelves, and access to a swimming pool, game room, and gym. Ooh, I'll definitely take a look. Hi, how did you like it? It's great. I love the amenities, but the bed and furniture are awfully dirty. Can they replace those before I move in? Sure, that shouldn't be a problem. Anything else? Yeah. I didn't see anywhere to park my car. Is there a parking lot in the basement? Yes, there is. Would you like to rent a space? No, I'd like that to be included in the rent. Oh, well, I'll see what I can do, but I can't guarantee that. Do you want to take it anyhow? If those two issues were solved, I would love to take it. That is the end of part one. You now have half a minute to check your answers.
Now turns to part two. Part two. First, you have some time to look at questions 11 to 16. Now, listen carefully and answer questions 11 to 16. I'm here today with Helen Warner, who has been a vegetarian for many years and is going to talk a little about vegetarianism. Helen, the concept of vegetarianism seems to have interested a number of our listeners, who have sent in some questions. To begin, what made you want to become a vegetarian? Well, when I was 16, I had friends who were vegetarian and they introduced me to the idea. My parents were typical of their generation and ate meat at least three or four times a week, so I didn't really think about it too much until a few years later. It was while I was at university that I really thought about it and decided that it was unfair to eat meat when there are so many alternatives available. Is there anything you miss about not eating meat? Um, no, not really. As I said, there are so many substitutes available these days, perhaps the most important of which comes from the soya bean. Soya is so versatile and is the staple substitute for most vegetarians. So what about the nutritional value of vegetarian food? Isn't it true that there are some vitamins that you can't get from soya or vegetables alone? Surely people need these vitamins. Yes, that's correct. But actually there is only one vital vitamin that is only present in meat. That's vitamin B12. Most vegetarians are aware of the implication of this and actually take B12 supplement in the form of tablets. Of course, the way you cook vegetables is also very important in preserving vitamins. Many countries, particularly the UK, have a reputation for overcooking vegetables. Water-soluble vitamins, you know, where the vitamins are dissolved into the water, are often lost. Vitamin C is a common example. However, the loss of vitamins can be avoided by microwaving or steaming vegetables, which is what I do whenever I cook. Some people don't want to change their cooking habits too much, so if you do boil them, simply cut down on the cooking time. So a vegetarian diet is fairly healthy then? Oh yes. A lot of people believe that vegetarianism is unhealthy, but that's actually not the case. Vegetarians are actually considerably healthier than many meat eaters. Consider for a minute the health aspects of the incredible amount of meat this country and others like it consume. The statistics for beef eating, for example, are quite frightening. The world figure for beef consumption is slightly less than 11 kilograms per person each year. Yet in Europe, the average consumption is nearly double that at 21 kilos per person. And in the USA, it is even worse, with the average person eating 44 kilograms of beef every year. Before you hear the rest of the talk, you have some time to look at questions 17 to 20. Now listen and answer questions 17 to 20. So are you suggesting that people stop eating meat altogether and everyone adopts a vegetarian lifestyle? No, not at all. Even in the healthiest diets, there is still a place for meat, but it should be eaten in moderation. Many nutritionists think of foods in terms of a pyramid, with the foods we can eat relatively freely at the bottom and the foods we should carefully restrict at the top. The majority of our diet should be composed of cereals, which would go on the bottom row of the pyramid. In this category could also be included such things as rice and pasta. Next, a good diet is followed by a roughly equal amount of vegetables and fruit. I have at least two servings a day of fruit and vegetables whenever possible. In decreasing quantities, you can then eat dairy foods, eggs, cheese, etc. Almost at the top of the food pyramid comes fish, carefully prepared of course, not dripping in oil or batter, and white meat. Chicken, for example, is 
a comparatively healthy meat, but again, a lot of this comes down to preparation methods. Right at the top of the pyramid come the ingredients of far too many Western meals, red meat and potatoes. It is particularly in that area that I would suggest moderation. Well, thank you very much, Helen. I'm sure that a lot of listeners are interested in your views. How could they find out more about the health benefits of vegetarian options? Well, there are lots of websites and books on healthy eating and vegetarianism, but it is always important to remember to consult your doctor before making any radical changes to your diet or lifestyle. That is the end of part two. You now have half a minute to check your answers. You will hear a discussion between two students and their tutor. First, you have some time to look at questions 21 to 25. Now listen carefully and answer questions 21 to 25. OK, guys, first off, well done. That was a very good presentation yesterday. Now I'm just going to ask you questions about it before I give you my feedback. Is that OK? Sure. Of course. Right. Well, in that case, tell me, Niall, why did you choose to talk about Rafael Nadal? To tell you the truth, I didn't. I think I... Better let Sheena handle this one. Sheena? Yes, it was my decision to pick Nadal. Now, that might be a strange choice for a presentation entitled Someone Who Inspired Me to Study Psychology, but... Yes, but I was going to say, it does seem rather an odd choice. Was it simply down to the fact that he's a sporting hero of yours and so a role model? You talk about him a lot, Sheena, so this much is clear. It's true, Nadal is someone I look up to, but my reasons for choosing him were totally professional. You see, I doubt, perhaps in the history of tennis, that there was ever a better match player than him, and that got me thinking, what is the secret to his success? How does he control his nerves so splendidly? The more we started to look into his background, the more I realised Sheena was right. Nadal was a perfect candidate for this study. He is, on so many levels, a very well-balanced character, and it was fascinating to gain an insight into the mind of this great champion over the last few weeks. I'll admit that I was at first somewhat unsure about whether or not I should back Sheena on this one, but it didn't take long for our research to put us at ease. So, while most of the students were researching Freud and other visionaries in the field of psychology and psychoanalysis, you were looking into a present-day sports star? Does that not strike you as a little odd? Of course, we knew it was a risk. After all, there was a danger that no one, least of all you, would take us seriously. When we stood up on stage and started our presentation. That said, I think it is in the spirit of psychology to be inquisitive and adventurous, and not just stick to the conventional. Otherwise, how would the field have come so far? as it has done already. Well, I must say, your risk certainly paid off. Yours was, without a shadow of a doubt, the most interesting and original presentation I saw. And judging by the reactions of the other students, I would have to say that everyone else was equally impressed. Thank you. I'm so glad you think so. Yes, but... Notwithstanding your excellent presentation content, we must remember that the marks for this project are awarded based on a number of criteria, and we'll examine those in a few minutes. But first, another question. Where did you find your sources? Well, and I don't quite know how we managed it, but we were able to secure a face-to-face -face interview with Nadal, 
while he was over here for the Wimbledon Tennis Championship, so we won't reliant on newspaper articles and interviews or any other forms of secondary sources. We did, however, find the library's sports archive an invaluable backup aid to help us fill in the gaps and piece together our interpretation of what makes Nadal such a mentally strong champion. Before you hear the rest of the discussion, you have some time to look at questions 26 to 30. Now listen and answer questions 26 to 30. OK. Well, as I said, congratulations again for your excellent work. Now it's time for my feedback. The first area where marks were awarded is in your use of equipment. I felt that had you not been a little too reliant on the overhead projector, and had you, for example, used the interactive whiteboard and audio equipment a little more effectively, you would have received top marks in this section. As things stand, though, your use of equipment was still very satisfactory. It's just a shame as it was an opportunity missed to score full points. The next area I was asked to assess is content. As you might have guessed, I simply can't fault you on that. Highly original work, so well done. As for your timing, I felt that the two of you were a little too over-rehearsed, so the presentation felt, at times, a little robotic. That said, again, it was very satisfactory, and you would get full points for effort. Sadly, though, there is such a thing as trying too hard, and that cost you top marks here, I'm afraid. Oh, I see. Right. What was particularly impressive, though, was the thick handout you'd prepared for everyone. I took it home to read through it afterwards, and it was very well written. But not alone that, it also enhanced my experience of the presentation itself on the day, as I was able to refer to the handout for further information on what was being discussed and to answer any questions I had. Very nice. As for your level of interaction, well, you had so much that you were intent on packing into your 20-minute time slot that, sadly, you run out of time at the end, which left no room whatsoever for interaction and no one had the chance to ask you any questions. You've probably guessed, therefore, that you did worse than average in this department and, unfortunately, your score will have to reflect this. Oh, my goodness. Everything sounded so positive at the start. That is a big disappointment. We work so hard. Now, now, don't be so quick to get deflated. Remember, your presentation skills only count for 15% of the project grade. Your score in this assessment, even if it were terrible, would still not be enough to prevent you from getting top marks overall. It's very hard to score well in the presentation assessment anyway, so believe me, you both did reasonably well. Thank you. I wish I felt like that. Yes, your feedback was very constructive. We're just a little disappointed with ourselves. Why? That's the end of Section 3. You have half a minute to check your answers. Now it turns to part four. Part four. You'll hear an introduction about the tutorial courses of the physics school. First, you have some time to look at questions 31 to 40.
Now listen carefully and answer questions 31 to 40. Welcome to Orientation Week. This is the Physics School session, and we'll welcome Professor Smith, the head of the school, to introduce you to the tutorial system. Welcome, Professor Smith. <laughs> Thank you. You may have noticed life at university is totally different from that of school. For you, tutorials are an important part of the teaching program. Tutors are the primary contact between undergraduate students and the school. A tutor is the student's personal tutor as well as their academic tutor. Tutorials for physics undergraduates consist of six students who meet each week with their tutor for at least 50 minutes. For radiographer students, tutorials will normally consist of a group of about 10 students who will meet fortnightly with their tutor for a period of at least 50 minutes. In the first semester, the tutorials are during weeks 1 to 11. For semester 2, they are during weeks 14 to 24. Everybody involved is expected to be present and on time, and the tutor will also be available in week 12 and 25 to discuss problems that arise during revision. But attendance by students is optional. Now I'm going to introduce to you the stages and activities of the tutorials. The induction period is from week 1 to 3. I know that a significant minority of you experience culture shock during your first few months at university, and the important function of this stage is to identify students who are having difficulty integrating into the academic program. In particular, tutors should check your attendance of lectures, tutorials, laboratory sessions, and this sort of things. Tutors also help you tackle work in a systematic and effective manner. Stage 2 begins from the fourth week. Some tutorials of this period are to be devoted to discussion or going over the students' lecture notes, but approximately 50% of tutorial time is to be devoted to coursework. You should finish the weekly homework assignments of two hours duration with at least 50% involving written work. At least eight homework assignments during the year should involve answering problems set on coursework. The written work collected by the tutor should be marked within a week of handing in, and generally the assignments should be graded. The third stage starts from week 8 till the 10th. During this period, math and four core physics programs are included. The majority of tutorial time should be devoted to work which supports the lecture programs and laboratory work. At least 60% of homework assignments should involve written work. The assignment may involve writing an account of, or notes on, a specified range of topics. The written work should also be marked and graded. Short oral presentations by students should be included. They are possibly on general physics topics or essays. The last week's personal development planning is a structured and supported process. The primary objective for PDP is to help you to become more independent and confident, self-directed learners and encourage a positive attitude to learning throughout life. It is undertaken by yourselves to reflect upon their own learning, performance and achievement and to plan for their personal, educational and career development. Finally, if without evidence of good reason you miss more than two sessions during a semester, or if the tutor is not satisfied with your progress, the matter must be immediately referred to the program director who will normally issue formal warning, verbal and written. This will inform you that your place at university is under threat of withdrawal if no improvement is made. That is the end of part four.